We're on air. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining the largest, most active and fastest growing uh, large scale scrum meetup uh, based out of New York City originally have gone globally. Uh, today we have uh, our, I would like to say this almost like a, the, the usual guest periodically coming to us and, and entertaining us and uh, giving us great content, uh, Professor Dave Snowden. Uh, I, at this point, probably Dave does not need any specific introduction, but for our, just to serve justice, I will mention that he is the founder of uh, Chief Scientific Officer of Cognitive Edge and the founder and the director of the Center of Applied Complexity at the University of Wales. He has done um, a huge uh, amount of work in the industry, um, uh, working for servicing, consulting, various corporations, clients, companies, and um, very importantly, serving the community, serving the industry uh, by uh, you know, sharing his wisdom for a bone, which is like so, so that everyone can learn and, um, and, you know, and use some of his um, expertise. Uh, today's uh, discussion, today's topic is really mostly questions uh, like Q&A because Dave, Dave just spoke to us um, a couple, like about a month ago. And uh, today he will be answering very tough questions that may apply to individuals, companies and industry and the industry in general. So I don't wanna steal any more thunder. So with any, any further ado, Dave, uh, please uh, take it away. Well, it's questions. So who wants to start, I think, is the best way of saying this. Exactly. Maybe we just want to prime the pump and let's be quiet. <laughs> so, folks, uh, any anything specific you would like to ask? And I'm sure you've seen the synapses in the, in the uh, on, on the meetup itself. Uh, bullets one through five. Are there? If helps, I can chat them. I can pick them in the chat again, right there. Anything that applies to organizational complexity, uh, management complexity, um, you know, centralized enterprise coaching, um, agility at scale. Those are the you know the the, the buzzwords that have been uh, thrown around a lot. Also, some of you, most of you, probably heard of the most recent announcement from Capital One uh with respect to technology roles more specifically agile lead or agile delivery roles i'm sure it's all over the web so maybe you can ask some questions with that regard in that regard and dave has uh, some views yeah, i need to be careful on that because we're actually working for capital one at the moment although not in that space so oh, okay um, I, I noticed that with interest i um, that somebody asked about Kenevin workshop as well i think Capital One, you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, I think fundamentally Agile hasn't delivered. And that's partly the fault of adoption. So, and I said, I think at a conference seven years ago, um, maybe longer than that, um, in Novi Sad, which is a rather weird place to give a conference anyway. It was the first time I came across SAFE, which was, shall we say, a formative experience. And I said, if you look at what's going on in Agile at the moment, you guys have got huge training budgets. You basically say you don't have to deliver anything, but you'll self-organize and deliver it sooner or later. And you're costing a lot of money and you're promising the earth. And sooner or later, some cynical manager is going to come and have a look at it and close the whole thing down. And I think we're seeing a bit of that. Um, too many coaches. I mean, all the money in Agile is made by coaching and training, not by writing software. If we're, we're brutally frank about it right so I think we need to recognize that I think the framework wars haven't helped um, I think safe made agile into a commodity and it became a commodity very quickly when safe came in it's amazed me the speed with which safe went from being something most of us thought was a Ponzi scheme into dominating the industry and if you don't know it's now I think um, Dean made 300 million for selling just over half of it. Um, and one of the reasons why you're now seeing SAFE, and I think this is hugely ironic, by the way, suing people for IP infringement, given that SAFE stole everything they have from everybody else. 
but they've now got a big VC company who've got American lawyers and they're trying to consolidate and control the space. So I think that was inevitable. And I think with the recession coming, it's a lot easier just to wipe out a department and, and use other people and finance sector. It doesn't surprise me that came first. So I think one of the issues is how do we make agile added value again? Now, one of the things we're working on on that, um, and you're going to be the first to hear this, by the way, well, not the whole thing. We've been working for some time on an open source approach so that you can actually adopt a multi-method, multi-vendor approach to Agile. Um, it's quite interesting at the moment, you've got various people trying to copy safe. You've got Jürgen with his bastardization of Spotify. You've got the Agile 2 people. Everybody's trying to say, I've got a framework which can control the space and oh, and by the way, pay me for certificates and training. That's kind of like the way the market works. We're saying that's actually, that's exactly the wrong way to go. What you actually want is to choose the best of elements of different, method, different methods and different frameworks and put them together in novel and unusual ways. So we started work on this about a year ago. We're already doing this, by the way, in strategy and knowledge management in the EU field guide, is what's called the HEXI initiative. Now, just to be clear about HEXI, it's not going to be branded Cognitive Edge or Kinevin Company. So we're creating it as an independent brand. We pledge to put it in community, into community ownership within the next three to five years. So that's an undertaking on our part. We're not going to do it straight up because then it would become a bureaucracy, right? And the way that works is that we take every method or framework and we break it down, in, or rather we don't, but the people who own it break it down into the lowest coherent units. And then for each of those units, we produce a hexi virtually and physically. There's all sorts of reasons why we use the hexi shape. And that describes the sub method. You know, it has a QR code, which takes you to the owner of the method, wherever they want to point it, so you can read more detail. So for example, our methods are branded Cognitive Edge, the QR code leads to the open source wiki, so you can use them. And to give the illustration of the way this works, if you take Scrum, um, there's absolutely no reason why you know, the lowest level of coherent granularity for Scrum is something like a sprint or a retrospective. So there's no reason why I can't peel out the hexagon for sprint and replace it with a three month time box from DSDM. So that's the way the idea works. So basically I can take different things out and put them into different combinations or different assemblies. And I can come back to this later if you want. If you introduce a rhizomic element, it can become an assemblage, but that's for another day, right? So what that allows me to do is to build from different components. And I'm really pleased about this. We've done very well on this. So we've currently, Scrum Org have just committed to actually officially create a hexi kit around their approach. We've done a deal with Iber Jakobsen to bring all the essence stuff across at, at um, practice level. So we've got two Kanban groups, we've got two Scrum groups, we've got the um, DevOps um, consortium, we've got business agility, and this is going to be open to anybody to do, but getting scrum.org was really important. That's kind of like the, you know, the, the, the C is row books in your shopping mall, which means other people will join. It's that sort of principle. And so sometime in the next five to six weeks, we'll start to push out the announcement about a whole new approach to Agile in which you choose which kits you want. We're, we're going to be completely agnostic about this. If you want Jeff's version of Scrum, you can have it. If you want Ken's version of Scrum, you can have it. Anybody can contribute. You buy those as packs, and then you start to assemble them to say what you can do. And that also has a safe transition approach. Yeah, I won't put it like this in public, but there's an awful lot of IT directors who know SAFE was a disaster, but they spent so much money they can't afford to admit it. So we're going to make life easy for them. Yeah, SAFE was a Trojan horse to get Agile into the company. Now we'll pick the hexes for the things we used in SAFE. We'll mark them as to whether they worked or not. We'll add new ones to it. So that gives us a transition approach. But it means you'll actually go to the originators of the methods rather than somebody who's just creating their own version of it. And, and that's an important principle. So that is kind of like ready to go. And I think we were right time, right place. And everybody's really excited by that. But we've also got the hexi kits for organizational development, for strategy, for foresight. 
So that allows you to start to build those in so you can integrate the IT practice more into the company. So that's the big initiative, right? And I say that's a change in the way that we think about the world. And as I say, we've got methods. So we've got pre-Scrum methods. We, we focus on complexity. Scrum is actually not very good at complex problems. It's very good at making complex complicated. That's its strength. So we've got whole new methods around capture mechanisms, user requirements, capture and articulated needs. Those methods will have our brand and the QR code will link to our website, but anybody else can compete with them. Yeah. Uh, two other packs we're producing. One I'm calling the pseudoscience pack, but it won't be called that officially. So it's things HR departments use, like Myers-Briggs, which we know are rubbish, but if they use them, they need hexes. That's the broad principle of this approach because you mark out where you start. And the other end is we're going to produce a potluck pack. So anybody who's got a really good idea for an agile method can throw it into the website. And once we get 25 or 30 of them, we'll put together in a potluck pack people can pick up. So that becomes a promotional opportunity. Yeah. And so anybody can put any combination of methods into this. They can choose what they price it at. We'll just charge at cost. You can give them away for free to get people to come to your website, or you can charge them as a money-making device. We don't mind. We're going to be entirely neutral. So that's kind of like the big initiative. Yeah. So that's where I think Agile needs to go, is multi-method, multi-vendor, deeply pragmatic, bottom-up, not mass adoption of a framework, not huge promises. I can talk later if you want about S-Drive mapping. Everything in complexity is about where are we, where can we go next? Not wouldn't it be nice if we got to this golden place in the future? The start journeys with a sense of direction, don't have goals, is one of the principles. So I'll shut up at that point and see if anybody wants to pick up on that or take any points out of it. That was a great um, primer. Thank you, Dave. Uh, folks, first of all, uh, there's a lot of uh, lots of questions in the chat, and even I can't keep up. Uh, if you have a question, just can you voice it, please? Unmute, ask. And, and by the way, I mean, if you don't know, I used to sit on Corba committees back in the 1980s. And I was arguing then, but nobody would listen to me, that people are objects too. And that's what we're doing. This is actually object orientation. It's objects with input output, with polymorphism, with inheritance. And you can make people objects to interact with software. And that in software architecture for me is really important. Because if you start to put people into the system along with software, then basically applications are emergent properties of multiple interactions over time, rather than being designed up front. So David, can I ask a follow-up question, which mm -hmm. is, is there a reference now to your Hexi approach that I can share with folks that aren't on the call? There, if you go onto our website, the Hexi kits are up for the EU field guide. So we've got Hexi kits for around the EU field guide and constraint mapping. Yeah, uh, they sold out within two weeks of us selling them. So we're we're going to do a second tranche soon. All right, up. The Agile Hexi kit is going to have its own announcement, so you can wait a few weeks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're getting all all the things lined up, and then all the partners on board with that. Great, thank uh, you. But the base hexi kit is already there. You can have a look at that. Great, thanks. And I think Ivor is going spare. I think Ivor sees this as a way of recruiting people into essence. I've got no comment on that, positive or negative. Yeah, if, if people want to go beyond practice level to the essence approach, they're welcome. But what we're doing is anything which is in essence is coming straight across at practice level. So that, that means when we're trying to reduce competition in the space by collaborating in, in different ways. Thank you for the hey, question. Dave, great, great, great question on the, on the Hexi. Um, but how do you, so it, it is kind of the unified field theory, uh, but how do you address the uh, larger systemic problems that all these vendors are out there, you know, trying to gather money for training and it's, there's not alignment with the business of delivering results, right? They're not rewarded when companies are successful, they're rewarded when they deliver training or get adoption of these methodologies over. Okay, so I actually don't expect SAFE to contribute to Hexi. Um, and I'm trying desperately to find anything in SAFE, which they didn't take from somebody else anyway, because I wouldn't mind producing it. I haven't found it yet. 
I think one of the reasons everybody is cooperating is safe is like the giant bloody Borg in the universe. And everybody's realized that trying to compete with safe as a universal framework won't work anymore. They, that, that, that's been lost. It's like trying to, you know, back in the 80s, we used to try and sell kit against IBM. You didn't stand a cat's chance in hell. Yeah, it didn't work. It was crap. It wasn't half as good as a VAX cluster, but people would buy a bone because nobody got fired for doing it. So I, I think it's right time, right place. And I think what people are realizing is, well, it's better if people can scan a QR code and come to us for training. Now, we are actually going to do a new training certification initiative as well. I mean, this will be later on in the year in which you get certified in a method, not in an overall approach. So if you pick up a method or tool, when you look at the hexes, they have symbols on the front which say what sort of training you need, what sort of experience you want, how difficult it is to do. So you can go onto a wiki for our methods, for example, and you can book on the training and we record that you booked on it. It might be virtual, it might be physical. Some methods say until you've done it five or six times, you're not competent. Okay, well, you have to write up cases and put them on the wiki which includes a hidden email address so we can check what you wrote with your client. And once you've got five certified by the client, then we'll certify you as competent in that method. All right? So we're trying to get away from the do a two day course, read some slides, let's do an open book exam into something where there's variable. And we're gonna make that structure available to vendors in the system so anybody can tag into it, All right? So that also means when you're buying a team in, you can see what methods the team have actually used. Not that they're all scrum masters, but did they actually do the things? Is It becomes part of the equation. So that, that's part of the approach we're adopting. And again, and this is me. I mean, remember, I've been a corporate strategist most of my life. You don't introduce novelty until the market becomes commoditized. What SAFE did is they commoditized the marketplace. So now we introduce something novel. But if Dean wants to produce his own hexi kit, we won't stop him. Thank you for this. Uh, folks, let's keep the questions coming one by one. Anyone else? And the, the safe consuming hexi, well, kind of, it's a bit difficult because hexi, I mean, they might produce their own equivalent. That's fine. Um, I don't mind having effectively a collective self-organizing group of multiple specialist vendors competing with one overriding org. Yeah, that's okay by me. No problem. Yeah, let it let it happen. Um, because that's a different type of competition. Yeah, I, I would prefer to have that market. Right? I mean, and as I say, I think Companies can't afford safe. You, I mean, how much does a safe implementation cost these days? It's multiple, multiple hundreds of millions, right? It, it's a lot of money, right? And that's actually companies are looking at that. We're going into recession. They haven't got that sort of money anymore. What sort of thing are they going to do? Yeah. But still, doesn't that beg the question around the you know leadership? I mean, without leadership, by right, safe a lot. It's safe because it allows the C-suite to get agile. And everybody else changed the way they work. I mean, how again going back to the right. forces? How do we get leadership? Yeah, how do we get leadership to you know play in this space? Okay, so first of all, when when a market becomes commoditized, leaders start to look for something different anyway. All right, that's just one on one strategy. Secondly, we actually see good agile consultants starting to put together assemblies of hexes and offering those. So, and this is one I've worked on before. That's what we call in the UK, Blue Peter solution. Yeah. So this is an assembly I know works. You know, we do this, then we do this, then we do this. And what you've got is you've got the actual reputation of all of the method providers. So it's not just you as an individual anymore. Yeah. So th that's how I see it working. Yeah. And we're not choosing Ken's approach over anybody else's. We've actually got two scrum kits coming out. Yeah, one, one, one comes from Ivor and he's working with Jeff. The other comes from scrum.org. If there's a third scrum unit, they can create a hexi kit. We're not fussed. And people can choose which one they use. It will be on the website. Choose which one you want to order. And I was explaining that to Nigel the other day. So Nigel Thurlow is producing a full hexi kit around his flow methodology. 
And he said, well, this is the best way of measuring value. And we said, well, yeah, okay, if that's in your case. Somebody else may measure it differently. They're entitled to do that. We're not going to make any choices as to who's right or who's wrong. This is something which is a structure in which people can put things and then the market will determine which take off and which don't. I think half the methods are bloody crap, but that's not going to, I'm, I'm not going to put that as in as a restriction. Yeah. There's another hand from uh, Supreet Bassi. Uh, I actually have one anchoring question, if I may, cool. but later on. Um, uh, Supreet, go ahead. Put your camera on if you don't mind. Hey, thank you. Hi. You're mute. Please unmute. You're still muted. Still muted. All right. Try to work on it. Uh, while you're doing it, uh, doing this, Don't hear you, Supreet. Sorry. <laughs> Quick question to you, and this is kind of in line with what you're saying, but I would, I don't want to anchor it too much, but just a bit of anchoring. We see lots of organizations, and I mean lots of organizations, trying to almost like gravitate away from safe because it's no longer popular. It's, it's almost like it's, it's, it's a bad, it's a bad. It's, it's perceived as something that you shouldn't be doing anymore, but because they have so much vested in it. They create their, their their own internal, they're like calling this an operating model. And they just take everything the last, uh, I'm sorry, safe has on a slide and refurbish, relabel it into their own internal. And that's what we're making it easier for them to do. So they can literally say, okay, here's the method cards. What did we use when we implemented safe? What worked, what didn't work? Do we want to change these things? So nobody implemented safe in its entirety. Nobody did that. Yeah. Everybody cherry picked. So you say, these are the things we did. And now you can add new things in, you can change them, you can augment them. But effectively, you're always going back to the originator of the method. I mean, it, what, what safe did with Scrum was criminal. Yeah. I mean, I, I think <laughs> well, one of the reasons Scrum is saying they're immutable is to try and protect their brand. I mean, they don't mind people changing it. But if you change it, you can't call it Scrum anymore. Yeah. Fair enough. Very fair. Folks, anyone else, uh, especially if you come from large organizations, banks, insurance, pharmaceutical, where you might have seen something like this, safe, 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 like being upsold. I mean, again, this isn't, from my perspective, it's not about safe. It's a, what, whatever There's David wants to say. Up, Gene, so. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Supreme, you, you are. That, Supreme. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, so, um, so, so I won't. Talk, I won't talk much about safe, but um, the what the one thing it is. So the way I look at it, it's not agile, right? It's an operating model for large corporations to put in something that, as you said, is safe, right? Um, it's it's an organizational construct that looks like a pyramid. And and so in 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 the world that you're putting together, uh, do you have something that replaces that? Yeah, I think um, I mean, the first time I saw it, I wrote a really angry blog post called The Infantilization of Management, Yeah, um, which is still highly current and gets referenced and gets attacked by safe people, particularly safe fellows from time to time. And I stand by it. All right. Um, I think that's where we the secondary market for creating assemblies of hexagons from different vendors. That becomes interesting because that tackles safe head on. And that allows people to actually create sub-assemblies and assemblies which are unique to each client. Yeah, And I think that's where we're moving at the moment. It's more of a craft than a sort of manufacturing framework. Now, I could get that wrong, but I think there's a space for that. Right? And I think you're right. I mean, safe, safe played off three things. All right, One is executives like to spend millions of dollars on something which won't deliver benefit for three years because then they can leave before they're held accountable for it. All right. Played off that. Secondly, people wanted to say they were agile, but they didn't really want to be agile because it would involve giving up too much control. And thirdly, and the really cynical stuff, remember when it started, if you did the four-day course, you could then train the three-day course without any experience whatsoever. And that was the Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And that played to the agile consultancy market, and they all fell for it because they all wanted a new source of training revenue. Yeah. And that that I think was that I think was morally wrong. Yeah, you, you, because you know you had loads of people, and, and that was what created the momentum. Yeah, 
But your problem is, I mean, this, I mean, I remember this. I was conference Lean Agile Scotland, and I said, partly if you go back to to um, the Agile Manifesto, there were three groups which came in. There was XP, there was Safe, and there was DSDM. Everybody forgets DSDM, and I was one of the three founders of DSDM. Yeah, it was ourselves, Logica, and Ed Holt, and we got together in a pub in Cheltenham and sorted it out over dinner. Uh, we were British; we didn't need a ski resort for a week, right? Um, but the point is that the whole of the Agile movement solidified around Scrum's bottle of delivery and business. Because to use Max Basso's concept, it was the right level of abstraction and the right level of codification to diffuse very quickly. XP was much closer, sorry to Alistair on this, to what I would call the heart of Agile. And I remember saying this, and everyone from XP cheered. And I said, well, the trouble is that you guys can't talk to ordinary mortals, so nobody can pick it up anyway. And they're still trying to work out whether that was a compliment or not. I think they think it was a compliment, at least I know Kent does. Right? So what SAFE did, I mean, you already got it wrong with Roop and corrected it the next time. They, they, they increased abstraction codification to get higher diffusion. Right? Now, if you go too far on that, you lose all value, and that's what SAFE has done. So we put it back a bit. But just keep this concept of assembly. Somebody who's a really good agile consultant should be able to say, well, look, I use this from Scrum and this from Kanban and this from, and this is my assembly guys. And I can help you implement that, but we can modify it. But if you don't like this bit, we can take it out and replace it with something. Yeah. And that is a much lower risk, lower cost solution. And in a recession, that's what you want. Low risk, low cost, but high stability in the components. And and that opens up a big uh, space for product management. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, and also it's also fractal. So different parts of the company will have different needs at different times. I still remember working with Telstra in Australia and nobody got promoted unless they were agile. So the engineering teams created one year sprints so they could actually call waterfall agile. I thought that was very invented of them really. Yeah? <laughs> so, you know, context adjustment is actually quite powerful. That's great. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yeah, hey, we got you. Hey, great. So uh, Dave, thank you so much. First of all, I really appreciate the approach because um, uh, based on what I have experienced, scaling is always a solution to a problem. Um, we don't end up scaling just because we've been agile for a year, two years. And I think that is one of the issues that we've seen in large corporations without getting the basics right. They just fall into the trap of scaling because now they've been there for a while without understanding the real problems, really. Um, so going on that theme, I would just like to know how would these hexes um, not lose that focus, the problem-solving focus of any particular solution that we're trying to propose for a problem um, through your uh, approach, if you could just highlight on that. Okay, so first of all, I mean, the first time I saw SAFE, I remember saying, this is wrong a priori. And then I realized that SAFE people didn't know what a priori meant, so I had to explain it. And I basically said, the way you scale a complex adaptive system is not by aggregation or imitation, it's by decomposition and recombination. Right? So if you want to scale agile, you can't do it the safe way. It is, in, it is just wrong in theory. Right? It just, it's just wrong. So what Hexes does is decompose and then allow recombination. So it's consistent with, with complexity principles. Yeah. And you've got that concept of an assembly which comes into it. Right? Um, sorry, can you repeat the other part of the question? I'm, I'm um, so, you know, as, as people come in, uh, look at the different options that are available to choose from, how do we so, not lose the focus on the problem? Um, you right. know, instead of just well, getting dogmatic, dogmatic about, oh, I just want to pick this. Um, okay, so first of all, you've got a collection of problems, right? So if you look on the blog, the recent blogs I've been writing, where I've been bringing back some of the old knowledge management methods, one of the ways that we address, um, and I realized as I was writing it up, it completely applies to our job. So what we do there is we identify what we're capable of doing, and we identify things that keep middle managers awake at night. Scrum, by the way, agile people always get this wrong. Power in an organization is middle management, not, see, not senior management. 
you do not want to be a senior management initiative because everybody will look to kill it as, as soon as the leader changes, all right? And Anarka famously said this. He said, change happens middle, bottom up. Yeah, it's, it's middle managers you start with, right? So what we do is we map all the things we're capable of against the things which are keeping middle managers awake at night. And from that, we create a portfolio of projects and only then do we choose the tools, yeah? So effectively, rather than say, I want to be agile and all this crazy nonsense about, you know, my agile program didn't work, so it's your fault because you didn't have the right mindset, which is what people do. What we say is, what's the current space? What can we currently do? What could we acquire quickly? What's actually real world problems? Let's create a portfolio of lots of micro projects, then some of them can fail. And then as the pattern emerges, so we stabilize that pattern and then we start to scale. Yeah? Now, if you look on the blog, you'll see that's fully described for knowledge management. I'm gonna rework that as an agile equivalent. But again, hexes are designed around that. And by the way, I originally developed this in IBM with a lot of resources behind me. Yeah, um, when we originally developed the methods. So the, the shape actually matters. So people put hexes, so playing cards don't work because people deal them out and put them into categories. Hexes force people to put things together in novel combinations. Yeah, so they cluster in different ways. It's, it's quite fascinating. I spent two years experimenting with this, proved it, and then discovered that somebody else had already proved it 15 years before and I didn't have the reference, but that was frustrating, but never mind. All right. Thank you. Uh, and if you could just put the link to the blog in the chat, I had to log off and log back in because I, you weren't able to hear me. <laughs> if you could just put the link in, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. If you I, I, We changed the name. So I'm not, if, if you type in Canavin Company or Cognitive Edge, that will take you to the website. And the blog is on the website. Yeah. Thank you. What's up next? Sorry, I've lost track of all yeah, the comments. There are a few so. more hands, I think, just to be fair, in the order. Mickey uh, and Jens um, did not ask any questions yet. And then we can go back to Jim and Arthur, if no one else. Uh, Mickey? Yeah, you talked about the hex. I, I, I like this way of alignment. Share a little bit of that journey. You say you experimented a lot. What were some of the things you you learn from how you, you're aligning, how you're creating that hex. Um, I must admit, I've got to make a confession here. I got the idea from Accenture. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's the only valuable thing I've ever got out of Accenture, but I went along to a workshop and they were using hexagon post-it notes. Well, but, but that's okay. I mean, acknowledgement of, of a source, is, you know, that, that's important, but they're... Had to have been things that you yourself took away. Okay, so what we found is that when people brainstormed on the hexes, they literally created like cell-like clusters. Yeah. And then we could peel out the center hexy, put it on the edge and give the cluster a label. When people use squares or circles, they put them into categories. So they thought in categories rather than in what we could would call clusters or combinations, which is what you want for complexity. So that worked. Yeah. What we then discovered, and this is the big thing, is that the hex is acted as a memory device. It's, this is what Andy Clark calls scaffolding. Right? So the way we run a hexy session is you've got a long, thin table, which is what you want. And by the way, we've gone horizontal, not vertical, because then people just move the things around and they don't worry about whether they're sticking to the wall or not, and more people can be engaged. But you need long, thin tables, and that's not a problem because if the venue doesn't have them, you go to the DIY store and buy wallpaper pasting tables. They're perfect. Yeah. So we have a long, thin table, which is the workspace covered in white paper so people can write on it. Then we have another long, thin table, and we lay all the hexes out that they might want in groups. And what happens is people get curious and they wander down it and say, oh, hang on a minute, I'd forgotten about that. Maybe we could use it. Or they say, this sounds interesting. Anybody know what it does? So what normally happens is people just advocate for their favorite methods or their favorite tools or their favorite process. This breaks that significantly. Yeah. And of course, the reason we put the QR code is you can scan the QR code and it takes you to a website which describes how to use the method. In our case, it gives you step-by-step -step instructions, yeah, um, which you can deal with. So what we found is this extended memory device was very useful. 
and it introduced greater variety into projects. So people would literally, we give them the kits at the end of a workshop and they'd be there for three or four hours, putting them together in different combinations, thinking about it in different ways, asking people questions. We didn't have to explain things anymore and methods they'd been taught three years ago, which they'd forgotten, they suddenly remembered and started to bring back into play. So I think that that's the real experience. The problem is to get the granularity right. So I've just done a big design session with scrum.org. Yeah. And we've now agreed what the right level of granularity is, but that's the sort of bit of art on it, right? Um, as I say, I think essence gets it right at practice level, but then it tries to go much finer grain than that. And granularity and complexity is always what we call a Goldilocks solution. It has to be just right. <laughs> uh, too finely grained, nothing combines. Too coarsely grained, you don't get novel combinations. So that that's kind of like the arty bit. And we are helping people to do that. We're not charging for that. We're helping people to get the initial kits up. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to dig so far down that you're handing it to them, but you give them good combinations that might work. Yeah. And, and we've also got this fractal nature. So, for example, the, the, the core kit, which will come out for our job, right? We'll basically have a hexi which says Scrum, another hexi which says Kanban. So it will be at that level, right? And it will have disruptive cartoons from Gaping Void and Comic Agile, and it will have the Agile Manifesto principles. And it will have a series of things from social and cognitive science you need to be careful about. And it will have the transparent overlays, which they're, they're a really major feature of it. Yeah. So that gives you your base kit. Then you can say, well, OK, I'll have Scrum.org Scrum and I'll have David's Kanban and I don't need anything from DevOps because I don't believe in it. That's yours. Then you, you bring those together and you start to play with them. So that's the way it works. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So on the Kanban part, we've got two sections. One is Ivo. Essence is working with Jeff Sutherland on Scrum. It's got it's working with people on um, Spotify and it's working with David on Kanban. So basically those come across, just come across from Essence. We just set them across at practice level. They're done. We've also got a Kanban consortium. I can't remember the name, but they're a group of Kanban specialists who work together. They're producing their version of it. Um, because they think David's is too proprietary and too lock-in, that's fine by us. It will be available. If somebody else wants to do it, great. Thank you for that. Um, got two hands. I just want to go in the order. Uh, Jens, I think you did not speak yet, and that's your turn. Yes? Yeah, thank you. Please go. So you hear my German accent. Sorry for that. It's a bit hard. Um, I, yep. I, I really like the idea what you do with the methods, but I have somehow the feeling that it's, you know, safe in the end, it, it grows so big also by adding on new features, new stuff, new ideas to an existing framework. In the end, it didn't fit together to, to a, a working solution, right? So now you suggest to have um, a collection of ideas, um, and I see it in different companies doing the same. They make their own framework. They call it safe or Spotify, and then they put some less things there and they put methods from over like Kanban and Scrum together, and then you can choose as a team where you want to go and all this kind of stuff. But in the end, um, how, how, do you, how do you guarantee, how do you help not to put the wrong methods together, building a solution. I mean, you know, I, I have 100 things. I put three things together. It looks like it's great. It looks like safe. It works the same. I think granularity matters, all right? I think also then there are a whole body of methods around it in terms of facilitation, things like ritual descent, working in parallel, validation, right? There's a whole body of associated methods that we can train people on or other people can train on which actually reduce that risk you never get rid of that risk completely mm -hmm. but it's a lot less risk if you're and remember each hexagon isn't just an idea it's a structured method or a tool with a whole body of material behind it so that gives you the quality control right so basically it's actually far easier to get things right if you're putting a small amount of things together and seeing what works that's a, the that's actually an agile principle 
but you don't have to invent everything from scratch. You can use something which already works, but at the right level of granularity. So that's the principle, right? Now, yes, yeah, some people are going to put it together badly. That's that's just life, right? I mean, you know, you, you yeah, can't stop I'm, that. You know, I haven't I'm, got a recipe for idiocy, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, so may, maybe an idea. When, when you put together a solution from a network, you, 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 you're taking a best of breed approach and yeah. keeping it transparent to see where most working combinations going to. You know? yeah, one of the things we're thinking about setting up, all right, you'll probably see this in an announcement, is if you want, you can put your assembly out for panel review and yeah. we'll allow people to nominate for panels. So you might say, I want a panel review. I'm, I want 15 people with this background. We'll create a framework by which those people People can review it, get paid for reviewing it, and act as an honest broker. But by the way, we're building this a lot at the moment. What's called distributed decision decision making. Mm -hmm. So put in three roles together to make a decision. But one of the roles is effectively an avatar, so you don't know who's occupying it. Keeps people honest. So we're working much more on this concept of distributed material, which isn't about the individual; it's about the roles. And that, that's actually a key switch. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Are you done, Jens? That's okay. Uh, Jim, you have been um, having your hand up, probably the second one. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Uh, David, uh, how do you address, or it's not how do you address, there's, you want to have a vocabulary that, that works, right? That everybody understands. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you address that in assemblies and in your base kit and, and uh, that? Good design. I mean, one of the best things that happened when I brought Nat in to run the company is she immediately said, we need a few more, we need some designers, not more consultants. And that made a big difference. So, you know, there, there's basically a design feature for different types of things. We've got the symbols on it. Yeah, and then we can start to create heuristics. Well, you you need you need to have a green hexy up front. You can't just start with red hexy. So we'll start to think about those sort of heuristics as we build it. But that's what designers do. Yeah. Um, when I tried to get this through for years with a group of consultants and they kept talking about it and nothing happened, I brought in a professional designer and one week later it was all done. Mm -hmm. So I've heavily got into specialist designers at the moment because they work really well. Yeah. That's great. So if I was going to put together an assembly, you would make that as a recommendation and yeah. have a designer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Jim. And by the way, we, we're open source in the spec. So we're setting up a facility by which we can take a HTML file and produce hexes for you. And you tell us how much you want to charge and we'll add that to the production cost. But we've also made the specs available. So if you want to produce your own, you can. Yeah, we, this, this is genuinely open source. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I don't think anybody will because it's a bloody grief to get the suppliers sorted out, but that's another matter. There's a question from Mary, Dave. Uh, Mary, could you please? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Um, hello. When you started, you talked about how Agile wasn't exactly succeeding and mm. how software wasn't getting out there essentially to to the customers so in this hexi model i'm thinking do we have the concept or the ability for organizations to see how value flows through the organization um, because for me one of the major reasons for failure is that we are so output focused a lot of organizations start their transformation and they don't even know the metrics that matter to be measured. They don't even know why they are doing this transformation. The, there's no alignment. So how does value flow, you know, the yeah. in terms of ultimate outcome, having that software in the hands of the customer, having that quick feedback? For me, that is where we really need to now focus to have that end-to-end streamlining if you like yeah i would say that was a good question but i learned not to do that in australia when one of them said i didn't ask you to rate my question you probably bastard i asked you to answer it so i'll just share that um, for other people to use right um i think there's several things first of all 
far too much of agile i mean we actually had an agile team work on our software for a bit and we almost went bankrupt because they didn't understand application software so every request from the users went into a backlog now if you've got a software product out there you've got to actually assess you've got to do triage yeah it's not a matter of backlog and waiting for something you need a product all right and the Agile people were in, well, we just produce this, and when we produce this, it's good, and we look at the backlog and we self-organize. So that's problematic, right? So I think Agile really grew out of primary software development. It's never been, it's never adjusted itself for application software development. And that's been my field for 40 years, all right? I mean, that's TSDM, and it's very different, all right, in terms of the dynamics and the people you want and such like that. One of the other reasons why we developed time boxes in DSDM is a time box allows for self-organization. So a modern time box says, we will deliver something between this, this value and that value with somewhere between these resources and those resources, but we will deliver it on this date. Right? Now that's anathema to some people in Agile, but the reality is in a multi-project environment from a business environment, dates matter because other resources are going to be committed. Now, the in interesting thing is within the time box, even over three or six months, a team will respond to a deadline and will self-organize. You just did you think, that range of delivery and the range of resources, right? And that's what we're starting to say, well, use that instead of a sprint, right? Now, the measurement one is more important. So we've actually been experimenting with Walters Romania on software-based retrospectives. And this will come out shortly in the coaching version of Gemba, by which every time you interact with users, you capture a story from the user, which the user interacts. Every time you see something or spot something which is right or wrong, you record it as micro narrative and you signify it, you index it. What that allows us to do is to actually produce a key thing. We can have the objectivity of numbers backed up by the persuasive power of narrative. So I can actually say, and this is called a vector measure, not an outcome-based target. So vectors measure direction and speed of travel for intensity of resource use. Yeah? They don't measure outcome. The problem with outcome measures is people game it. Yeah? It also requires you to predetermine upfront what value will be, whereas the reality is, as you actually engage in projects, the nature of what value is can actually change as you start to move into that space. So we spent 15 years working on vector measures in things like the health service, because actually that direction, speed of travel, intensity of effort is a much more important measure than an outcome, and you can't gain it. That's the other aspect. Then you'll notice what we're also doing there is we're combining measurement with reporting, with knowledge, with lessons learning. So it's all done within the same system. And I can extract different things from that. Now, that is, if you look at a Hexi kit, that's called Gemba, and that's a cognitive edge tool. No? So it's one thing you can use. No? So that's where I would go, and that's where we come from on that. And yeah, if you don't know it, um, I can link the reference ultimately. Whenever people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. Yeah, but all the is evidence that where it. OKRs come in is because OKRs, o OKRs get the science wrong. OK, so the science is completely wrong. All the science says when people are working for explicit goals, it destroys intrinsic motivation. And one of the reasons is Goodhart's law, any explicit goal is an approximation of what we think we know in advance of what we want to get to. And in a complex system, you can't know in advance what the right solution is anyway. Which is right? why so we want to engage system. with the customers and we want to, you know, constantly get and that's my point. So, for example, we have methods, I mean, expanded trios, for example, where we put junior programmer together with systems architect together with customer trained to talk to IT people. It's a lot easier to train users to talk to IT people than the other way around. And what we'll do is we'll throw 20 trios at a problem for three weeks and see what they come up with and then combine the results. That's far more effective than a systems analyst. And it means we're engaging the users in the micro design process, not just in writing down a set of story points. Yeah? And also then as you interact with users, we're recording the user stories about the interaction and feeding that into the measurement system. Yeah? 
And that, that's, that, that's a complexity principle. What we do, we're entangling the different groups rather than creating linear standoffs. And I would, one of my arguments against things like Scrum is they create a linear standoff. You know, the, the users appoint an executive and negotiates with the Scrum master, then we deliver something and boy, will they love it. Yeah, and you really want to entangle them all the way through the process. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, we'll take a very quick, short one. Last one coming from Arash because he had his hand up. He didn't speak yet. And then we're going to wrap. Arash, could you make it quick? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I work in Geico and one of the challenges that we've had besides SAFE is how do we actually use agile principles in design before even going into the implementation and delivery? So I'm curious to know your thoughts in terms of application into design. That's actually where we focus. So as a company, we said, you know, we're good at complexity, all right? Complexity is where design happens. It doesn't happen in the transition from complex to complicated in Kinevin terms. Nearly every agile method I've seen, it does small iterations around a minor variation. And that's actually liminal complex moving to complicated. So we have a whole body of methods to change the way that we do design. So for example, mapping unarticulated needs. Because if you can map existing capabilities against unarticulated needs, you can deliver unexpected value very, very quickly. Yeah? And we have a formal method for that. We spent three years on it. Yeah? The TRIOS method I gave you, remember the famous case on this, if you give radiologists a batch of x-rays, ask them to look for anomalies on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, they won't see it, or 83% won't see it. So if I've got 15 trios working on a problem in parallel, some of them will see gorillas and they'll get attention. Yeah. And, you know, there's other methods and tools we've been developing, but that our speciality. And we're also currently working on a whole new approach to agile architecture in which we're creating typologies of scaffolding. So you choose the type of scaffolding you need based on the uncertainty. You define people and software as objects which interact with the scaffolding, and that allows applications to emerge based on use rather than having to be designed in advance. Yeah. So there's a whole body of stuff on that, and we teach some of that in the Rewild in Agile course, yeah, um, which we've got to bring to the States soon. We should. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, folks, uh, Dave, uh, we got a We'll probably start wrapping up just because we got one minute before the hour. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to first and foremost thank you for t finding the time to make it out here at this late hour, uh, delivering this great talk, very energizing and very revealing, I must say. Really makes people think. I've been getting some private comments just about that. Thank you very much. Uh, to everyone who joined today, thank you also for coming, creating a great vibe and also asking questions. Uh, we'll make Dave, Dave's uh, recording available soon. And uh, every asset that he has that he mentioned should be available on his site. Uh, or can, you can just reach out to him directly on LinkedIn. And we hope to have Dave back hopefully sometime soon again. I don't want to tire you too much, Dave, but uh, this no, seems okay. to be Pretty, always uh, happy, always happy busy. to speak. Yeah. I'm well. Yeah. And, and and I'm happy to see some people that actually faces whose faces I recognized from my past clients and uh, my network. So people actually are coming back to listen to you. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, be well, stay well, be healthy and safe. Don't do safe, I think, right? <laughs> Be safe, don't be safe. Yeah, and we, you know, this isn't a so bad So mean, thing. so mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I just uh, was asking for it. It was funny. So thank you all. Uh, be well, and uh, we'll see you soon. We have some great events coming up soon, so please stay tuned. Let's thanks see. so much, Dave. Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, thank Dave you. and Gene. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Dave. Absolutely. Thanks, Gene. Cheers.